All right, we in Second Corinthians chapter three, and we're looking at the ministry of the Spirit, and the subtitle of that is one word this morning, and it's freedom. The ministry of the Spirit, freedom, it'll be a part of um, what we look at in the passage we're covering. And so we're going to be, again, Second Corinthians chapter three, been in this uh, chapter for several weeks now, uh, discussing the Old Covenant, Uh, the Old Testament, the Old Promise, as compared to the New Testament, the New Covenant. And that's what we're going to be studying together. Uh, As we join in this study, uh, I said at the end of the message last week, um, how I often feel about preaching is that I feel like the the call of the scriptures or the declaration of the scriptures, it's, it's teaching is here, but I feel like I often hit down here uh, because they are so grand. And I would just say, uh, obviously glorifying to the Lord. And it's our hope today that as you quiet yourselves from the world around you, that you get your mind in the scriptures and let the word of God minister to your heart. And it'll be my purpose to try to intend that I accurately reflect the word of God. That's our goal. So, so do we need the Lord today? Are you glad you live in the United States? Thinking about moving to Canada, are you? (laughs) You like what you see going on in Canada these days? So many people are like, Canada, what's going on in Canada? I know about Canada dry, I don't know about Canada. Well, the world is a mess and continues to be so. Are you surprised? You know what you see? You're seeing across the world what it looks like to walk without God. What it looks like to try to sort out life without the Lord. Everybody's got the idea that somehow that if we just do the system right, it's going to be great. There is no system on the planet that's going to be great outside of the Lord. Can we come to that? And um, if you're looking for some new political way of doing things, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. You've got to have the Lord. And uh, thank, thank the Lord that he's there to help each one of us this morning. We needed him yesterday. We need him today. And we're going to need him tomorrow, should he tarry. And wouldn't, wouldn't it be a great thing if the Lord came back and spared us from one more Pinewood Derby? It'd be great. And uh, are you tired of hearing about that already? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, um, something I want to, uh, my mind goes 100 places because in, in the administration of the teaching of the word in our ministry, there are several places where obviously I'm involved. I'm, I've got my Sunday school class I teach here in the morning service and then teaching on Tuesday nights, uh, going through um, very expressly um, and unusually playing some clips from other churches in our valley, um, exposing what's going on in the valley. Some of you have made me aware of some things that are happening in the valley that I wasn't really aware of. And it's, uh, uh, I forget, Sandy is Harvest something, Harvest Crusade, and there's a big conglomeration of churches uh, that are, Pastor Phil, come move these for me. Because I'm going to look over there at you two, and I'm going to be looking through these mics the whole time. Doesn't he look better than me? I think, what a good looking, what a good looking dude. Isn't he, he a good looking dude? Yeah, yeah. I like him because he represented the pastoral staff yesterday, and his car got second. <laughs> uh, he didn't know, but I was going to give him $1,000 if he got first. Anyway, um, this, this, um, this thing going on in the valley, I, I, I don't want to speak evil of it because uh, I don't know enough about it, but I do know enough to know there, is, uh, there are churches involved that I believe are not anchoring in the word of God. And uh, that concerns me. And, and let me just say across the platform, okay? Across the platform, Derek taught it uh, this morning in his, in his Sunday school class, we have got to have an anchor for truth in this world or we are utterly lost. And that anchor for truth, yes, is the Lord. 
But how does the Lord communicate truth to us? Answer? Right, you've got your Bible right there. And what's surprising to me is the amount of pressure in what is called the Christian world to leave the sure teachings and truths of the word and under the banner of what is called Christianity. So I um, have become alarmed by this lately, more aware of it lately through different interactions with people. And <clears throat> I, I'm gonna give this to you. In, in, the, in the secular world, it's no mystery. In the secular world, people are after what? They're after what benefits them, okay? And that's no shocker. Everybody wants to be comfortable. Everybody wants to have what makes them happy. I get it. But in the Christian, what's called the Christian world, there is a surprising, there's a surprising movement of attack there where there are so many who are leaving the word of God and leaving it behind and still maintaining the name Christian. And you and I, as we are gathered here, you know, yes, I'm the preacher here, but I'm one of you. And for those that are visiting, we're a church family. Um, for those who know Christ, we're all ambassadors of the truth of Christ. And it's necessary that we be teaching the truth. It's extremely necessary. And um, really, the, the Lord is the only hope for this world. And as we come to this passage <coughs> this morning, I take a run up to it by going back to verse 14. And we're really looking at verses 17 and 18 this morning. Those are our two verses. But in verse 14, you have this phrase at the very beginning of it. But their minds were, next word. <coughs> their minds were blinded. We talked last week about being blind is not a good thing. And the Lord does condemn it, but not in the physical sense, sense because when someone's blind, it is a malady, a difficulty that is uh, often no fault of their own, something they're struggling with. And again, no condemnation there, but there is a condemnation <coughs> to being spiritually blind. And that's what he's talking about in verse 14. And he says, regarding the Jews, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away, and I'll say this because it's gonna come up again, is only done away in who? So what's a veil do? What's a veil do? It blinds you and makes things hard to see. Um, I always, I don't know where the tradition comes from, but I always think about this with weddings, and I'm sorry if it's a part of the wedding coming up, no offense. I've never really understand, understood the veil. It's like, he already knows what she looks like. <laughs> like, what are you hiding? <laughs> and I'm just that weird, twisted dude that it would be so funny. If I, if I was the lady, I would, I would do wild, crazy makeup. <laughs> so that when it came time and he went like this, he'd go, <laughs> you know. That is YouTube worthy. Uh, that's <laughs> it makes it so you cannot see. It makes it so that you're hindered, obviously spiritually here, blind. Um, it says, unto this day, when Moses is read, verse 15, the veil is upon their where? Now, what's the heart meant there? The heart is, there is the idea of where you're making your decisions. It's where who you are is represented. There is a, a veil on the heart, a blindness of the heart, verse 16. And by the way, uh, we, a lot of last week was spent in other passages reflecting how blindness happens and it's through rebellion. And it, it's not hard to figure out. It is that when we rebel against God, blindness happens. Okay, so verse 16, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. There's only one way for the blindness to come off of your eyes. Or as Paul, with his Damascus Road experience and what happens thereafter, the Lord has to take the blindness away. He has to do that for you. So here's the desperation of it. You can live a life by living under lies your whole life. And you can live that way. 
You can, you can do your entire existence that way. But the blessing of God and the blessing of the scriptures is that he's made it so that you don't have to. Matter of fact, God says wisdom starts where? Where does wisdom start? The fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom starts and ends with the Lord. And God has given wisdom so that we can navigate life, but you've got to make a decision as to whether you will rebel or repent, whether you will yield to the teachings of God's word or whether you will resist them. You've got to decide. And and this message, as we said last week, is true, yes, for the lost, But it's true for the believer too. It's true for the lost in regard to salvation. You've got to come to Christ or you will be eternally, as the Bible says, condemned or damned. But for the believer, we recognize that we need to yield to God's teaching. And here's what, here's what I'm saying. Now, you have got to be careful about everybody that's telling you they're a Christian. Hello? Oh, we understand that? Are you suspicious today? Are you? Should you be? Should you be suspicious of me? Come on. <laughs> what is wrong with you people? That is going to get up and leave. So. <laughs> By the way, Pam, good to see you. Tell Fred hi. And um, the reason you need to be suspicious is because we're all sinners, every one of us. And even the guy standing up here, you need to examine what's being said here by the light of what? The word. And our allegiance is to who? It's to Christ, to his word. So you've got to make that decision. You've got to settle on that yourself. But there's only one way to have that veil, that blindness take away. It's Jesus. We need Jesus all the time. Lost need him to be saved. Believers need, need him to have our own predispositions, our own sinfulness corrected. We've got to have Christ. So do you want to be rescued? You've got to turn to the Lord. Now, verse 17 is where we pick up today with um, really the last two verses of this chapter, and we're going to be in several places, but there is there's, um, some complication in verse 17 and 18, but really 17, but I think really uh, borne out as a cross-study of Scripture as to its meaning. It says, now the Lord is that who? Spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We're going to tackle this uh, in, in two ways. We're going to first of all reference back to verse 3 of this chapter. Second Corinthians 3 verse 3 it says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. There was an introduction in this new covenant of a difference between the old covenant that was born out in the law and the new covenant, which is born out in the spirit. And there's gonna be now a culmination of that coming to the end of this chapter. Well, who is that spirit? It's been alluded to and said throughout this chapter, but here in verse 17, there is a declaration that the Lord is that spirit. Well, who is the Lord? The Lord referenced here is Jesus. It's who's been spoken about (coughs) in the verses coming up to this, going back into verse 14, which veil is done away in Christ, okay? And then you have that Christ being pointed to in verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, that person turns to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, who is that Lord? The Lord is that spirit, Okay, so this can be confusing. Well, is it the Lord or is it the Spirit? And as I'm often uh, prone to say, it's not either or, it's both and. It's both and. And this is why we believe in a trinity. We believe in a trinity because the scriptures teach 
that there is God the Father, that there is God the Son, and that there is God the Spirit. And the three are distinct persons but one. I, I don't know who it was, maybe it was Pastor Phil spoke last Sunday night and said, can we define or describe the Trinity? And you can. You ever heard the Trinity described as an egg? But is the Trinity just like an egg? No. Some people use triangles, some people use other stuff to try to describe the Trinity. I think they're a good effort, but the reason we fall short is because God is a big God and an amazing God, and he's more complicated than we know. But he's revealed enough about himself so that we can know him, and so what do we know? We know that there is God the Father, who is holy God. We know that there is God the Son, Jesus, who is holy God. We know that there is God the Spirit, who is holy God. All right, but in this verse, it says that Jesus, the Lord, the Lord is that spirit. And then you have further, and when the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So you go back to verse three, and you find that this introduction to the new covenant, the New Testament, the new promise, is bound in the spirit and not in the stone. Okay? The new promise is bound in the spirit, is tied to the spirit, not the stone, not the law, okay? So as the commandments were written in stone and were the covenant that God gave to his people to be his people, to follow the law, and we've already given a lot of groundwork to talk about the law. The law is not evil, was not evil, but it was never meant to be the end of God's work. It was all meant to point to and magnify what God will fulfill in the New Testament, the new covenant, the new promise. And that promise is born of the spirit. It's not a letter of the law that you're going to follow that says, I'm a follower of Christ. Instead, it is following the spirit that makes us a follower of Christ. We're gonna bear that out in just a moment. So we're gonna take a moment here to talk about the spirit. So the Lord is the spirit. The Holy Spirit is a distinct person, yet he and the Lord Christ are one. Would you take a moment and go to John 16? We're gonna talk about the Spirit in John 16 and in John 15 as to the distinction of the Holy Spirit, all right? And it is who he's referencing back in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 3. Now the Lord is that Spirit, that pneuma, pneumos. He is that Spirit, all right? It is Jesus who is that. But yet the spirit is distinct from, but united to Christ. So in verse seven and eight of John 16, John 16 verses seven and eight, I like us to read out loud together. So if you've got your Bible open, would you read with me? John 16, seven and eight. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The comforter described here is who? It is the Holy Spirit that Jesus would send at his departure. John 15, back one chapter, verse 26. Again, identifying who the comforter is. John 15, 26. You just turn one page back, so let's read that out loud together. John 15, 26, reading with me. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He shall testify of me. So I got a question for you. Is the Holy Spirit being misrepresented at all today? Really? <laughs> who's, me who's misrepresenting him the most? Is that a loaded question? I'll tell you who I'm focused on. I'm focused on charismaticism. I'm focused on all those people that say they're doing things in the Holy Spirit that aren't born out in the word of God and that's how you not, know they're not of the spirit. Want to know more about that? Come back Tuesday. Okay, or join online Tuesday. It's what we're talking about. Okay, so the spirit magnifies who? Who's the spirit magnify? Jesus. He is going to testify of Jesus. It is the spirit that is in the world today that does the work of drawing anybody to Christ. 
If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, hear this? If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, nobody would be saved. Nobody. So we walk a delicate balance here while the world around us and much, much of what is called Christianity is misrepresenting the Holy Spirit. We don't default, want to fall in a different place as a, of a pendulum swing and misrepresent him on another side. In other words, there are so many in fundamental circles that are so reactionary to the Spirit that they almost live in a, in a way that the Holy Spirit has no impact upon their emotion. And the truth is the Holy Spirit is identified in this by emotion. He's identified as the comforter. And comforter is largely an emotional response. He is intuitively and innately involved in your spiritual and emotional well-being as a follower of Christ. There's a lot we could do on this, and I'm honest, we could spend weeks and weeks on this. I will just say in my own life, learning this truth of walking in the Spirit has been one of the most profound teachings in my own life. Based largely on Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That has been eye-opening to my spiritual life, and many have the same testimony. That being said, when we look at... John 16 and John 15, the Holy Spirit is indeed an individual. He is sent by Christ, by the Father into the world to inhabit the lives of his children, the lives of all who know Jesus. And for that, we are then going to learn something from 2 Corinthians 3, that it says in the last part of John 3, or 1 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, that there is liberty because of the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of Christ through the Spirit. So as we look at verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 3, go back there one more time, and we're going to kind of anchor down into the teaching of the freedom that is in Christ. All right, so John, I keep saying John. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, I'll read it to us again. Now the Lord is that spirit, and here's what he says. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And that liberty, simply for our understanding, is freedom. Okay, it's freedom. All right, free from what though? Free from what? The context of the passage bears it out. What's the, what's the new covenant under the spirit compared to? The old covenant under the what? Under the law. And as compared, the law had bondage. The law had, had, had adherence to this and that and the decrees of God in the sense of you need to do these things to show who you are in me. And that these, again, there were sin offerings made when, when, uh, when, uh, when they had sinned and there was always this payment of sin through sacrifice and it all pointed to the coming of a Messiah, a lamb that would be that perfect lamb that would take away the sin of the world. It all pointed towards that, but they could not do it themselves. The law, the laws of God could not accomplish that in themselves. So we find that in Romans chapter eight where we're going to spend a large part, a large part of this next section as a teaching of why there is liberty in, in the spirit, liberty in Christ. All right, so go to Romans chapter eight. We're gonna start there in just the first two verses. What is this freedom that we have? It is freedom, first of all, from condemnation. All right, so let me, let's take a moment here. Do you have any guilt in your life because of your sin? Let me ask it differently. Could you have guilt because of your sin? I will tell you, this is one of the doctrines that tends even believers to struggle with the truth of the gospel as compared to their own works in their life. It is this thought, am I really forgiven? Am I really forgiven? Are all my sins really taken care of? And so 
really not coming to the full conclusion of the gospel, there's for many the confusion after hearing the gospel and responding to the gospel, this doubt of the carnal mind, this start of the doubt of the natural man that says, but are they really, are they really gone? My past sins, my present, my future. Well, Romans chapter eight, listen to what it says. There is therefore now, next two words out loud, no condemnation. Now, it gives always, and this is why we, again, have to agree that Paul, in his testimony of declaring the new covenant, said that he could speak boldly. Why? Because this no condemnation is not a mystery. This no condemnation isn't, I've got to do that and that and that and that to finally know that I'm okay with God. There's one thing that you have to do. That is, come to Jesus, just like the young people sang. You've got to come to Christ. Why? He says, there is no, therefore now no, condemnation to them which are in, who? Isn't it clear? One name, one person, no condemnation is based on your relationship with Jesus. Are you with me? So listen, folks. Who's worthy of this message? Nobody. Nobody's worthy of it. Now, you won't like what I'm going to say because it's not a friendly thing to say. Now, I love you people. I love, I love all of you. You know what I look at? When I look across this room, you know who I see? I see sinners. I'm not naive. As, as, as nice as you look, as nice as you look, and I'm glad you do look nice. I'm glad you're not tempted to walk around like me in a cart with a grumpy face all day. Uh, I'm glad you look nice. But I know something about you. I know. Wait, no, I, I gotta do it like the charismatics do. I'm feeling it over here. There's somebody over here wearing a black suit Stand up, coach hands over your heart. <laughs> Power of God's gonna hit you in. Never mind. <laughs> Samantha Smith goes. <laughs> uh, if you watch some of the videos I've been watching charismaticism, you'd get all that. But uh, there's no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. No condemnation. So what that means is in this room, I'm looking at people who've lived a life of sin. Now, have you sinned all the ways you could sin? No. But there is, is there evidence, both before your salvation and after, that you're a sinner? Okay. Now, I, I said you and you, but guess who's right there with you? Guess who's there with you? Pastor Phil, thank you. <laughs> yes, you and I were, that's right. <laughs> uh, he's preaching tonight, so I should not do this, right? <laughs> oh, man. Um, we're all there, but here's the glorious message of the gospel. Because of Christ, none of my sin is gonna be held against me. I'm going to say it again, because of Christ, none of my sin is going to be held against me. Can you praise God for that today? I mean, it ought to really, the joy of having all of your sin done and taken care of because of Christ ought to give everyone in this room a sense of just praise God. We could call it relief, and truly it is. And so we don't wake up as believers looking at the list of what must I do, what must I do, what must I do? It is all done in Christ. Verse two, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You see that phrase? That's the New Testament, that's the new covenant. For the law of the spirit of what? 
life. Now, you remember what the this old covenant was called? It was called the ministration of what? You remember the word? Ministration of, the ministry of death. Why? Because the law cannot save. Doing cannot save you. Giving cannot save you. Behaving cannot save you. It's not what can, it's who can. And who can has a name, Jesus. That is awesome. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, oh, listen to the phrase, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I am free. There is freedom in Christ. It is the freedom of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the life of everyone who believes in Jesus. Communicated by title, this New Testament, New Covenant, the ministry of the Spirit. Further in your chapter, chapter 8, verse 9 through 11, would you look there? Chapter 8, verse 9 through 11. A little difficult here. Because it says, but ye are not in the flesh. Now, wait a second, but I am in the flesh. That's what this is. I, I feel it, I feel it every day. But this is a doctrinal statement based on the freedom of Christ or freedom in Christ. You who are in Christ, ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, this again is why, and it's probably going to come back up again because of the Tuesday night study. This is why we teach again that if you are saved, you have the Spirit of God. This in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 teaches the same thing. But here's the thing. Charismaticism, the false doctrine of charismaticism says, hey, you can get more of the Spirit. And I'm going to say, no, you can't. You either saved and have the spirit or you're lost and don't. And I will tell you, I'm working on right now to make sure in my slap in the pulpit that I somehow come back to a position of grace <laughs> and try to be sweet about it. But I'm angry at those who are using power over people who don't know their Bible and telling you wrong stuff. So if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not saved. And you say, but I don't know if I have the Spirit of God. I'm gonna help you right now. You know how I'm gonna help you? I'm gonna tell you how today, right here in this place, that you can know that you have the Spirit of God. Amen. If you'll text me 1999. <laughs> no? I should charge more? Okay. Um, here's how you know you make a decision. You ready? Believe your Bible. Amen. Believe your Bible. The Bible says if you've come to Jesus, he's given you his spirit. If you come to Christ, he's not only bought you by his blood, but your body becomes the temple of somebody who? The Holy Spirit. Who tells you that? God tells you that in his word. It's God who tells you. So you want to know how you know you have the spirit? Because God says every person who's his child is sealed by the spirit, indwelt by the spirit, and will be delivered to the person in presence of God by the power of the spirit. Amen. That's Bible. Not some man's thinking, not some man's teaching you something that the Bible doesn't say. That's what your Bible says. And I'm pleading with you not to be misled and misused by those who would tell you differently.
Believe your Bible. That you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Verse nine, Romans eight. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, here's what he says. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, listen to this. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. It is the Holy Spirit that indwells the lives of his children that is going to give you resurrected life. But I'm going to tell you something doctrinal. All right, so you, you can argue with me, and that's fine. You may have a difference of opinion. Come talk to me later. We'll, we'll, we'll sort it out. I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people struggle. Listen, I don't, I, don't, I don't disrespect. I think there's a lot of beautiful pictures in burial. There's a lot of beautiful pictures in burial. A lot of seed planted in the ground and a lot of, a lot of beautiful uh, symbolism there. I'm going to tell you what. It doesn't matter if you're buried or cremated that God is able to bring you not only into his presence, but to resurrect your body. If he can create all this out of nothing, he's certainly able to resurrect your body. And there are countless saints who've died before by the burning of the stake who are gonna be resurrected in Christ. Now, that's just a little side note, but to say this, it is the power of God on display and the miraculous hand of God that resurrects any of us. And how do we know it's going to happen? We only know by faith. And I'll tell you something else. What is the problem of this day's age? This day's age is seeking signs. You want verification? I see angels. I don't know why I pointed over there. I <laughs> want verification. I see angels. I see this. I've had this experience. And now I know. I'm going to tell you something. I want a more sure word of prophecy than your fallen person. And I certainly don't mean to disrespect anybody's experience, they can be powerful. But your experience is not the foundation of truth. And what I've just said to you is the grand difference between what you're hearing in churches and churches like this as opposed to many churches today. Many churches today, the Bible is not the authority. Your experience is. But God says something and it matters and there's freedom in Christ. Now, I know I'm stealing somewhat from Tuesday, but it drives me nuts. These pastors that stand in front of people and say, hey, you know, I feel God's moving over here. You know, uh, can I, and sing a lot of couple and say, hey, you know what? God, God's leading me. You, you're going to have the best year ever. This is the best year. You're going to have blessing like you've never had it. And like I said, in a year's time, come back and talk to those people. Was it the best year ever? Two years later, what happens when you base your doctrine on what some man said through his vision? You're ultimately going to be disappointed because it is not the rock. The rock is God and his word. It's freedom from condemnation. That's what liberty is in Christ. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty There's freedom from condemnation. There's also freedom, arguably you could say the same thing, but freedom from bondage. We're still in Romans 8, just a few verses down the road. And verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the who? Sons of God. For he have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, what? Abba, Father. 
Jameson Foster Brown puts it this way, such was your con- condition before you believed, living in legal bondage, haunted with incessant forebodings under a sense of unpardoned sin. You hear what they're saying? I'm going to read it to you again. Such was your condition before you believed, living in legal bondage, haunted with incessant forebodings under a sense of unpardoned sin. If you don't believe the doctrine of the Bible, you're going to wrestle with this thought. Have all of my sins been forgiven? Nowhere in this is the spirit of, am I worthy to have my sins forgiven? Nobody in this room is worthy. It is the grace and kindness of a savior that rescues any of us. Anybody watch your sins on display on the screen? What if we could take you for a day? Would be a, you, would you be ashamed of what goes through your heart and mind if it was thrown up here for a day? Now, we're not talking about people who say they're saved and don't care about walking with God. That's not what we're talking about. But folks, the freedom that's in Christ is we are not in the bondage of performance. We're not in the bondage of if I just do a little bit more then God will like me. God never likes us because we're worthy of being liked. God loves us because he's the one that puts that value of worth upon us, not because we are worthy, but because he chooses in his love to condescend to us and love us despite or in spite of ourselves. There is no bondage. You don't live under a law of performance. You live in a relationship now that is a relationship that is led by the Spirit. You know what one of the number one doctrines that we hold here is that we say that this place is a Holy Spirit-led ministry. You know who the greatest administrator of the church is? No pastor, no group of pastors, no group of people that have a council together or, or bless God, a committee. Those things aren't bad, but the greatest administrator of the church is the Holy Spirit in you. Leading you what to do, when to do, where to go, what to say, when to say, how to say, how to live. It's walking in the leadership of the Holy Spirit as he navigates life with you. This is about relationship with God. You talk about joy. That's that's an amazing thing that God is with all of his children every day, walking with them through life and the nuances and the particularities of your life and able to do it, not just one who walks with you, but who actually cares about you. It's an amazing thing. So a believer then is this person of verse 14. Now this is the other side of that coin. Some people would take this doctrine and say, hey, it doesn't matter how I live. Well, you need to read your Bible. Romans 5 talks about this. Romans 6 talks about this. Should we continue in sin? What's the answer? What, he knows one word. That's a great answer. God, God does a little stronger than no. When you say no, you should be saying no with an exclamation point. But the biblical language of that is God forbid. So what's the life of a believer? The life of a believer is I trust God to lead your life to grow in him. I trust God to lead you to be what you're supposed to be. I trust God to lead in your life, to navigate you exactly where you need to be, when you need to be, and how you need to be. He's good at what he does. He's gracious in what he does. And you know what it means? You don't need no pope. You don't need some spiritual authority who has another higher rank than you to tell you 
what you need to do. You've got the Lord, and you've got his word. I'm gonna say something that you're gonna have to receive in grace. Now act like it. Is that fair? Clark puts it this way. All that were under the law were under bondage to its rites and ceremonies. And as through the prevalence of that corrupt nature which, with which every human being is polluted and to remove which the law gave no assistance, they were often transgressing. Consequently, they had forfeited their lives and were continually through fear of death subject to bondage. When you don't know that you are saved, you go to bondage. There are Christian called denominations that teach this as doctrine. That you can lose your salvation based on your performance. None of us has the power to keep our salvation by our fill in the list. All you can do is hold on to Jesus because he's the one that did it all. Romans 8, verse 16 and 17, to close out this Romans 8, comparative of 2 Corinthians 3. So Romans 8, Sixteen and seventeen, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, I've gone to this passage to show you the freedom in Christ, not just, not just children. And if children, then what? Heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him that we may also be glorified together. Now, what do I do? We go to Rome, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We're gonna come to the freedom that's in Christ and what it all then means. And... Several passages here. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by who? How are you changed? Say it again, how are you changed? It's right there. By the spirit of the Lord. I'm gonna again encourage you folks. Now we are rebellious stinkers. But God is... Is, is doggedly faithful. He keeps after us. He does not give up on us. Yes, you have failed. Now, I, I don't, listen, I wanna take just a moment here just to, with the heart of a pastor, pastor, our people here to comfort you. None of us should be so arrogant to think, well, I finally arrived and that's why God, that's why God loves me. But neither should we live in the oppression of our failure. Do not live in the oppression of your failure. How many times does a righteous man fall? The Bible says how many? It says if a man falls, I think it says if he falls seven times, what does he do? Get up. Get up. Stop grieving over your failure. Talk to God about it. Repent of it, but get up. And move forward in a God who loves you. Move forward in a God who's going with you. Move forward in a God who is faithful despite our failures. Get up and walk with God in the spirit. You're taking breath today by the grace of God.
Look back over your life. Are, this, are there some things that you've done wrong? Are there some ways you've messed up? But do you know where you are right now? Do you know where you are? You are in a place positionally in your life as someone who is a beneficiary of God's grace. Today, you're a living example of the mercy of God where you are, where you sit. And he is telling us in these passages that he wants to walk with us today. And he is going to work in you today to accomplish his end in your life. Now, yes, you can continue to live stubborn, but why? I'm just going to say it as clearly as I know how God's way is best in every way. And we can mess it up in so many ways, but God will help you to walk with him because he's the one who initiates relationship. He's the one that draws you to himself. He's the one that gives you eyes to see. And in that relationship, he gives you his love. He gives you his grace. He gives you his mercy. He gives you his faithfulness. He gives you, I never quit on you, is what he gives you. So much so that he tells you that you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but received the spirit of adoption so that we are his children. There's incredible doctrine here. And I'm, I'm gonna say, I thank God anybody's out here listening to this message. I, I, as I was coming through the, those doors, I, I was thinking that, that very thought, praise God anybody is here to listen to this message. Not because I have anything good to say, but the word of God is great. And why would we sacrifice the sureties of the word of God and what he has said for for the spiritual mumbo, jumbo, and hocus pocus that so many churches are doing, living under experience, and I saw this, and I saw that. Give me the word of God. Now, my declaration there is because that's what I need. And I think you do too. And the point is, there is stability in Christ. And he offers it to everyone that will be led of his spirit in this new covenant. You're outside of that covenant. You've not come to Christ. Come. Come to Jesus. He invites you freely. Believer, if you've come, walk with him. Let the word of God be the guide in your life that tells you the mind of God, the teaching of his word, so that you can be stable and anchored and growing. Now you are gonna hear this again, and you're not alone, I'm right there with you. I'll just close by saying, we need our Bibles. Amen, can we agree? And praise God, he's given it to us, young people in this room. He's given you a Bible. You can know the Bible yourself. And I want to tell you this, praise God for your parents, but you need the wisdom of God. And he'll be there for you just like he is for your parents. Everyone in this room, we need the Lord. And praise God, he's extended himself to us. Now we make a decision. Will we be led by the Spirit? 